Hello, hello, you're very welcome to If I Were the Minister for Education from Onshaw.net, a regular podcast where I look at the world of primary education and I let you know what I would do if I were the Minister for Education. This is Simon Lewis speaking. On this week's show, I will be looking at life after Josepha Madigan, the rate of physical aggression is rising in our classrooms, and why Estonia is the new Finland and lots, lots more besides. If you're interested in um, subscribing uh, to our newsletter or uh, tuning into our latest podcast, you can do so by uh, logging on to onshot.net slash subscribe, or you can go into your favorite podcasting platform and subscribe there. This uh, podcast is also on YouTube these days, so you can go onto onshot.net's YouTube channel and you can hit subscribe as well, and we'll be there and ready and waiting for you every couple of weeks. The newsletter is available to you in your inbox every two weeks if you subscribe and as well as the latest podcast episode. I'll also be telling you other stories that I've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks in bite-sized bits. I'll also be showing you some exceptional posts I found on Twitter or X as it's now known. And every two weeks I'll be uh, providing you with a mini CPD project which generally focuses on technology and education. Uh, This week, I've made a video about using AI and the wisdom of the crowd to develop a chapter of a textbook. Uh, You can have a look at that by uh, subscribing to the newsletter, as I said, on onshot.net slash subscribe. And I have a lovely template for you to create a chapter of a textbook. Uh, In the video here, I give an example. I go back to my birthplace of Rathmines in Dublin and I create a chapter of a textbook on the history, the geography, the luganum of Rathmines or Rathmuenish. And and I'll show you how to do that. So let's get straight into our episode where we look at the big story over the last two weeks, which was the resignation of Josepha Madigan from the political world. She will not be contesting the next election, but stepped down as a minister for special education. Possibly we are not going to see a minister for special education again. I thought it might be a good idea to maybe look back at the last few years about Josepha Madigan's legacy, how she did, what she did and what she may have been able to do better, and if we are to get a Minister for Special Education in the future, what they might do if they are the Minister. And I did this uh, on my blog, uh, which you can read on simonmlewis.medium.com. And what I have my post is, obviously, if you're looking at YouTube, you can see my picture here of a lookalike of Josepha Madigan cutting a red ribbon in a school. And I felt that if we're talking about Josepha Madigan in the future, or her successor, if there is one, We should be cutting red tape, not ribbons. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my thoughts on Josepha Madigan's, and I suppose in the wider context, the way politics has been going in education over the last couple of years. And it was kind of historic when Josepha Madigan was given a position, a new position of the Minister for Special Education, a junior ministry, but a a ministry dedicated to special education right in the middle of COVID-19 actually in 2020. And after a decade, I said, after a decade of cuts and serv- to services and supports to special education, um, the portfolio did come with a very big budget and you will know that budget because every time you mention special education in a PQ and a question in Daw, they will tell you how much they've invested in special education. It's two billion a year, by the way, just in case you don't know. But I argue in my article that rather than spending that money wisely, she kowtowed to populist pressure and left the portfolio a bureaucratic mess. I want to chart how she did. And you'll see from if you're reading, you can read along if you're watching the video here or listen along if you're on the normal podcast where I said I felt when she took on the post, it was the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and it was really any minister's first obstacle was to navigate that time. And in fairness, she really struggled, I feel, uh, to find her feet, uh, particularly in terms of her language, where, as she would say, she misspoke on a number of occasions. Probably uh, her most famous examples were when she referred to children without special needs as normal children. And she also talked about the lack of special school places as being like the mother and baby homes, trying to compare that, which caused a little bit of consternation. Though I would be more forgiving of her latter misspeak than her former one. Anyway, she uh, tried her best, I suppose, to assert herself with uh, the Minister Norma Foley uh, to uh, get services for children with additional needs during uh, COVID. And the, the big thing, I suppose, the big pressure from the advocacy groups 
but to get the children back into school, even though there was a pandemic at the time and people were very scared that they would contract this disease, uh, to which there was no vaccine at the time, that there were people dying uh, at the time. But many parents were basically saying the teachers were being very selfish by not allowing their children to come back to school, even though they themselves wouldn't go face to face with uh, people in their own jobs. And even funnier uh, to me, and I, it was never a funny time really, none of the advocacy groups were doing anything face to face either. However, they thought, sure, teachers should be working face to face with children for the greater good, despite the fact that they weren't. Unfortunately, Madigan decided that she would take the side of children with additional needs by creating divisions between the advocacy groups, parents and schools. And relationships remain fractious, even today and most recently in the conflict over special education teaching allocations. And that fractiousness is bizarre. It's weird. You've got schools, uh, school principals uh, up against their own uh, representative groups. You've got parents uh, up against the Department of Education, parents fighting with schools this time. And you've got the advocacy groups as well in the middle as well. It's all a bit bizarre. Um, anyway, rather than restoring an education system during that recession, they decided, Josefa Madigan and Minister Norma Foley, rather than actually bringing back the resources that were there, because some of you might remember, the first thing that happened during the recession was a 15% cut to, serve, to uh, resource hours, as they were known then, to children with additional needs in schools, which has been continued now that they've removed uh, the supports for children with complex needs, rather than all that kind of stuff, because they're not the things that matter really to children with additional needs. They don't need learning support. They don't need any of that kind of stuff. No, what they need is free hot lunches, free school books, free summer programs and free school buses. Yes, and Madigan, who described herself as being relentless, what they wanted and what they needed was to open as many special classes for autism at all, at, at all costs without actually thinking whether those classes were the right solution. And I want to think about, ponder on this a little bit. There's some, some things the journal argued about. I, I mentioned a lot of these free things that have happened, like free hot lunches and free school books. No one argues that these are bad things. These are great things for education. Yes. When you think about them, free hot lunches, obviously, I will absolutely defend that. I think that's fair enough. Uh, that creates equity in the system. So children from disadvantaged backgrounds and children if not from disadvantaged backgrounds will all benefit. And we've seen studies uh, across the world about the benefits of uh, hot lunches in schools. Free school books is great for parents and affordability, but not very good pedagogically. The free summer program has been, is fine, but again, not been evaluated in any way, shape or form. And the free school buses is just a complete mess. But I could have, I have a whole, I could do a whole episode. In fact, I have done a full episode on school buses and why they are a mess as they are. But opening special classes, as many of these special classes for autism as possible without thinking about, are they the, actually the right um, answer? And you could talk to different people. You could talk to Inclusion Ireland who may, who might have opinions on that. You could talk to people who, who study these kinds of things. In fact, I had a look and Joanne Banks and Michael Shevlin of Trinity College noticed and noted in their 2022 survey after all these classes are open, is there's been this rapid expansion of these special class models, but only limited investigation of their efficacy. And uh, they've said basically that a lot of this was essentially influenced by parents looking for them without actually thinking whether they're the right solution. Yes, on the surface, they sound like great ideas. Small classes, a teacher, two SNAs, six children. What could possibly go wrong? But what possibly goes wrong is the fact that what's, what happens in these classes? What about the local therapy supports? There's none of that. What about the training for the teachers? What about actual trained teachers in special education? What about appropriate accommodation, in fact? Because a lot of these things are built in, in small prefabs that are isolated from the rest of the school community. They're, they're, if they're lucky, even, they're, they're in prefabs. A lot of them are in these sort of, I don't know, repurposed cupboards, probably for want of a better word. And as well as that, special classes, as they were set out to be as integration uh, for integration into mainstream, they no longer serve the aims now that they were set out when their scheme was first introduced. And it's a real pity because I, I think if they were done well, they could actually work very well. And I, I think some will argue opening special class for autism is necessary. And many might argue that they work well. Simply, I think, simply putting six children in a classroom with a teacher and two special uh, needs assistants is a model that only works thanks to goodwill and guesswork. I think our entire special education needs model is founded on goodwill and guesswork. It works when it works. But when a child needs more specialised interventions, not just a small class and a couple of extra people or, or a light therapy room, 
when it goes beyond that, it can disintegrate very quickly. And we are seeing over the last couple of years, a lot of cases been taken by parents against school boards and management for things that I would argue are not the fault of the school, but the fault of the system that is completely relying on goodwill and guesswork. We don't have any specialized training course for teachers to work in special education. You can do a couple of day course. You can do these one day courses on very basic. They're the same courses have been going for the last 20 years, but there is no specialized a qualification for a teacher to work in a special class. We don't have uh, the, the specialist therapies, the wraparound therapies that are needed. It's just, it's not good enough and it needs to be good enough because opening these classes, yes, it makes headlines, but does it make a difference? I think Madigan would have done better to focus on much quieter solutions. So cut out this cutting of ribbons, opening uh, these headline grabbing things about opening this, opening that. It's all very sexy and lovely, but we need quiet solutions. We have children that are sitting on waiting lists for interventions like speech and language therapy for years and years, and we are not training enough people to become speech and language therapists. We need occupational therapists. We need loads of other therapies and they're not existing. We need therapies for uh, mental health, emotional, behavioral, psychological, uh, psychological interventions. We need all this and we need more learning support, as it was known, literacy and numeracy support. And instead, schools are getting cut and they might say, oh, we ploughed in more money than ever. But there are more and more, there are far more children with additional needs than there were several years ago. And we are not putting in the amount of resources they need. We are not following the children. We are allocating schools resources with junk data. And it, it, do you know what? The whole system is founded on goodwill and guesswork and sand. And I mean that by a bad foundation rather than actual sand. It's going to sink and it's going to sink really badly at some point. And what's going to happen is we're going to put layers and layers more of bureaucracy as we were doing that already. And it just isn't working. Anyway, Madigan's ministry is now going to be absorbed once again into the main education portfolio. And it's possible we may never see a special education minister again in future cabinets. However, if we do, we need to learn from the mistakes that have been made. For example, the front-loading model that we introduced in 2017 for special education teachers and special needs assistants has been an absolute failure and we need to move back to systems where children's needs were linked to the resources that were going to the school. So a child's needs can be followed from birth all the way through their schooling and schools should never ever be asked to prioritise their support to the highest levels of needs, every child, no matter what their needs, should get their support. We shouldn't be asked to choose for children who should get support and children who need support not to get support. We also need to stop the spiralling bureaucracy that is happening. For example, in 2003, and this I always give this example because I think it's a really good example for what's happened. In 2003, the National Council for Special Education, the NCSC, had 15 office staff and 72 people working directly with schools, the CINOs. Within, by, within 15, 16 years, there were then from, from 15 office staff, there are now 150 office staff and only 66 people working directly with schools. So fewer people working in schools and loads more people working in the offices. We need to cut that red tape. However, most importantly, we need a plan. We need a good plan. And the first step is to bring is to bring back the parents, the advocacy groups and the schools. We need to bring them back together talking again. A lot of damage was caused by Josepha Madigan with her divisive tactics in trying to pit parents against each other. And it works so well. If you only have to go on Twitter or X at the moment and put something up about special education, you have these, you've got some lovely advocacy groups, but you have some horrible people claiming to be advocacy groups. They, they, in fairness, they, a lot of them are behind these anonymous accounts. You don't know who they are really, but some of them you do, you do see and they can be vicious against schools really unfairly. And, and I think it's not right. And uh, what we need to do really, rather than giving out to each other and getting defensive or anything like that, because I suppose I'm already getting defensive in what I'm saying there, is we need to bring parents, advocacy groups and schools back together talking about what do we need and having an absolute clear path of what's actually best for our children. Because that's essentially uh, the all that we, all of us want, when we actually do want it. And that's the annoying thing about this is the minister and, and successive governments before, before have been cutting and cutting um, the amount of supports for children with additional needs. Parents are getting very frustrated by the fact that they're not getting any of the therapies from the HSE. They're not getting any of the supports from the various uh, agencies. 
And pretty much sometimes the only support that a family will have for a child with additional needs is the school. And when the school can't fulfill all the needs for that child, who is there to blame? Only the school. And it just, it becomes a mess and it isn't right and it's not fair. And a school, schools, and in fairness to schools, the fact is that we were actually doing as much as we possibly can through goodwill and guesswork. Loads of us are going for training to try and do as much as we can. Many are doing things that we shouldn't be doing. We are, we're taking on recommendations of occupational therapists and speech, ther- speech and language therapists, even though we're not qualified whatsoever to do a lot of the stuff that's been asked of. Where some, uh, a lot of teachers in the past and a lot of SNAs in the past are learning different skills, such as uh, how to do uh, law, which is a sign language. They're learning about uh, educational technology, which, which assistive technology can help a child to communicate in different ways and teaching the children to do that and teaching themselves how to do that and helping families. And unfortunately, it's very unforgiving. It's really unforgiving. There is a huge division that's being created, and I believe is being created by the Minister for Education and Josepha Madigan, where there is absolute kind of an atmosphere of blame and anger against the very people who are doing their very best a lot of the time. And yes, they do make mistakes and sometimes there are bad eggs in there. But overall, and I, I don't think it's, again, I hate using percentages, but I think it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be unfair to say 99% of education staff are doing everything they can to make school a, as positive a place as possible for every child, whether they have additional needs or not. And it's really difficult. It's really difficult when the wraparound supports aren't there. And if there is to be a minister for special education in the future, the only thing they should be doing now is ensuring that the wraparound supports are there and available for children with additional needs and that we have teachers that are fully qualified in working with children with additional needs. And we need to examine whether special classes are actually the answer. Why are we opening all these special classes? And if we are and, what, and, and find out what is their purpose, we have, just to, so people know, and again, this is just a, a point of interest, the special classes that are out there, not, over 99% of these special classes are for autistic children. They're for no other additional need, really. You've got well over a thousand autism classes, but you've got, I think, less than 10 behavioral and emotional, emotional needs classes. You've got, in terms of reading classes, I think there's less than 20. Uh, so we're doing huge damage with these by, by not giving children what they need. And the next minister for special education needs to do that. As I say, stop trying to look for headlines, start looking for solutions. That's what I would be doing if I were the Minister for Education. Let's move on uh, to the next story. And it looks, uh, the next story that came up in uh, my news was basically this results of a survey from the INTO, which highlights that half of primary school teachers were the target of physical aggression in classrooms at a survey found this year. Now, if the INTO were nice people, And they looked back at surveys done by the National Principals Forum, who did exactly the same survey in 2019, where they found that the same number of primary school teachers were the target of physical aggression in classrooms. They wouldn't have had to do this survey at all if they stopped ignoring the brilliant research that is done by the National Principals Forum. And if you would like to learn more about the National Principals Forum, some would argue the only advocacy group or the only lobby group doing anything at the moment to help Uh, school leaders in their role, highlighting brilliant research, if I may say so myself. I I do help them and I'm part of the National Principal Forum. It sounds like I'm blowing my own trumpet here. But I I am really proud of the work that we do. I'm really proud of the fact that when it came down to it, uh, when it came to the set allocation, just going back to special education at the moment, we're the only lobby group that spoke out about the set allocation and how uh, complex needs, children with complex needs were being um, absolutely cast aside. And we're still in there. And I loved the fact that um, the Department of Education were so rattled by the fact that over 700 principals signed a petition about the set allocations. They went uh, to the trouble of going through each of those 700 names to try and disprove that so many principals had, had actually felt that way. And they tried, oh, it was just ridiculous. And, and, even, and also on top of that, they got their friends, they got the IPPN to write some press release to say, oh, all this research is nonsense. They really got rattled by it. It, it. it was embarrassing. It was really embarrassing to see both the Department of Education and the IPPN going to such a low to try and tell principals that they were wrong 
around uh, the um, set allocations. And that's still going to go on and that's not going away. And I'm hoping, because I suppose when this is going out, the INTO's Congress will be happening. And I imagine special education will come up in some way. And I hope someone will mention uh, the complex leasing. But what I am most proud of the National Prince Forum, the one survey I'm most proud of, is actually one called the inclusion illusion. And when I say inclusion, I only mean a special education in this case. I, I find the word inclusion very annoying. But for this uh, purposes, we called it the inclusion illusion because it's a good uh, title. And it, it basically was the result of over a thousand primary school principals telling us exactly how special education was working in their schools. And one of the findings, there was loads of findings in it and uh, really, really good uh, findings. But the one that actually made the headlines and actually was on the front page of the Irish Examiner back in 2019 was the fact that I think it was roughly about the same, over uh, 60% of primary school principals said that uh, physical aggression uh, happened within the school quite regularly. So anyway, a few years later, the INTO have uh, found exactly the same, uh, which is unsurprising, when they could have actually been doing something about it. I'm not sure if they're actually going to do anything about it this time anyway. But uh, the report really says that, the, uh, in fairness to the INTO, I actually agree with them in this case. I'm often critical of the union. But the thing is, I do absolutely agree with their findings. Uh, the lack of adequate uh, therapeutic and mental health supports for pupils and the lack of additional training for teachers are the big causes of this problem where there is physical aggression uh, in the school. Now, what the union might be doing, which is something they should be doing, is protecting their members from physical aggression, whatever way it comes, and to put pressure on the government to ensure that those wraparound services and saying our teachers are not going to put up with being physically attacked, physically being hurt in their workplace. And you need to do, you need to put in place these things uh, so that this doesn't happen because it's not, and it's not basically, the balance here is trying not to blame the children because it isn't the children's fault. No school in the country uh, these days anyway, very few schools these days have not experienced uh, a child who is experiencing, who's exhibiting physical aggression. And every single time it is born through absolute frustration and distress. It's not because one day a child says, I'm going to be bold and I'm going to hit my teacher. That doesn't happen. It's through distress. There is still that line there where a child is not going to be hurting or acting out physically against their teacher unless they're in a state of distress and the government need to do something about it. Because if they don't, we're going to find this, this the profession that we, are, that we respect or supposedly respect so much. But we're finding teachers are leaving the system because it is too dangerous to be there. It's too hard and it's too difficult. And it's becoming unsafe. And there are easier and better and well-paid jobs out there that, that don't have the same sort of uh, thing going on. And not, when I'm talking about physical aggression, it's just one thing. But also the way the, the, the uh, role has uh, become very disrespected. A lot of the time, not only in the media, but um, also in, through uh, the structures uh, of the system. It's not uh, catching up. As I said, teaching used to be this really uh, attractive profession because of the holidays. But now most companies are catching up with making their places attractive. It's nice to go into a lot of workplaces now. And some of the benefits of other workplaces can outweigh the nice holidays that teachers uh, seem to be beaten over the head with uh, when they get it, such as working from home and things like that. But anyway, let's move on to Estonia, which has now become the new country. Oh, this is an article from The Guardian. By the way, th this has popped up on my screen. You should see this. You should support newspapers and media if they're, if they're doing good stories. I have supported The Guardian and I do um, offer them a little bit every time I see an article that I feature in this podcast. But Estonia has now the best schools in Europe. They've taken over from Finland and it's uh, they, their headlines here. Free lunches, brain breaks and happy teachers. I mentioned free lunches earlier on, how I support that as a mechanism. But the thing about Estonia versus Ireland, the way we do free lunches is so complex. And I just don't understand how we do it. Every school has to organise their own free lunches rather than different local areas and a local education authority providing schools with the free lunches and delivering them and, and, and paying people to do that. No, we have to do everything through a grant and the grant generally doesn't cover it and we have all this waste and blah, 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 blah. In Estonia, they probably do it better. I'm sure they do it better. In fact, I know they do it better. The idea of brain breaks, this is, this is something that's not new to most teachers in, in Ireland. But we don't have the supports for those brain breaks, as they call them. We, we call them movement breaks a lot of the time. And they're obviously inbuilt the Estonian education system and happy teachers. And that's interesting about happy teachers. What they do is they treat their teachers and they have all those wraparound supports that we don't have. 
they also do a lot of the stuff that Finland is famous for, particularly using their space so much better. I really recommend you read uh, this article because I think what I saw when I went to Finland, uh, and I think Estonia is no different, I, I'm, I'm hoping to go to Estonia one day, it's how they use their space and how they have these wraparound services so teachers can focus on teaching. Small class sizes, yes, is part of it, but isn't the biggest part of it. It's that use of space outside. How do they use the outdoor spaces? This vast place. All these schools are built on really large complexes where the children are outside for a lot of the day. They're able to move around for a lot of the day. Children walk to school. They walk home from school because their school is within walking distance from their house and they aren't under the whole kind of obligation of having to choose a different school because they don't or aren't of the same religion of whatever. Anyway, all the same reasons. I'd really recommend you read the uh, article. I just think there's a lovely picture of a school. They build schools so well. Uh, this is just uh, just some of the outdoor. Look, at your, I'm just scrolling down so you can see some of the pictures. That's the lunchroom. You see, can you, they have a lunchroom, for example. We, again, f- throw these uh, lunches into the uh, discuss your 10-minute seat your lunch. But there's all these kind of things that make such a big difference. Look at that. That's one of the schools. Isn't that beautiful? And we have our repeat generic design when we come to buildings. Just the creativity. Now, this didn't start today or yesterday, of course. Estonia decided that they would prioritise education in 1997 and 20, nearly, actually 25 years later, they have the best education system in Europe. Richard Bruton, back in 2018, said by 2026, Ireland will have the best education system in Europe. A fat chance of that happening if we do not put in the money, the resources, the time, the structures and everything else. We, we've done nothing to make Ireland the best education system in 2026. We punch way above our weight and I just have a feeling our luck is going to run out rather than the other way around. The biggest strength that we have in Ireland is that we speak the English language, I would argue, as our first language, as our main language. I'm not saying that as a to, to discount Irish as a language at all. I'm just saying it's such a good thing that we have. We can go anywhere in the world with that language and be able to communicate. But we are working in conditions that somehow, I don't know how we manage to do so well. But anyhow, that is Estonia. I wanted to move on to a different article which uh, came up uh, from the Irish Times, which I subscribe to. Um, Students are stressed. Teachers have little choice in creativity service. Why the Irish classroom needs to change right now. This is an article that has been heavily criticised by teachers. It's by Carl O'Brien from the Irish Times, where he asked everyone and anyone, the great and the good, about what the Irish classroom needs to do to change right now. And he asked lots and lots of people, but forgot to actually ask anyone working in a school. Instead, he talked to uh, various different people, and I think it's well worth going through them very quickly. It's well worth reading this article, although it is subscriber only, so I I won't go, uh, you'll have to probably pay for the benefit of seeing it. Um, Luke O'Neill, who has nothing to do with primary schools, thinks personalised tutoring is a way, but he, which is okay, uh, I don't know. Scrap the CAO point system, so Katrina Sullivan, I agree with her, although that's second level, so I steer away from second level really there. Include creativity in an utterly central way, says Joe O'Connor, who is a writer. Funnily enough, I agree with him. Again, pursue passion projects. Bobby Healy, who is, uh, what is he? Um, I actually, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, and you know what? I also agree with him. And what do we have? Connect to nature. Dara McAnulty, who talks about that, a naturalist uh, and a writer. Do you know what? I actually agree with him. And we move on. An all-island education system. This is from the uh, INTO. John Boyle, who you could argue is the only teacher within this. He is a big into creating an all-island education system, which is really interesting. And I don't disagree with it, but it's going to be, if we are to do that, If we are to do that, what, and the biggest barrier to that actually will be religion, which is interesting because up in, uh, as bad as things are down south, we we have our religiously controlled education system, but but most people in it don't take it very seriously. Whereas go go up north, if you're in a Catholic school, you're in a Catholic school. If you're in a Protestant school, you're in a Protestant school. And if you're in an integrated school, which seems to be similar enough to educate together, except for the fact that they are still Christo-normative in a big way. I think an all-island education system, the biggest barrier to that is the religious question. You've got Adam Harris, as always, uh, talking about autism and neurotypical and making classrooms in, e- e- equal and embrace of, of all neurotypes. And again, I don't disagree with that. I agree with that. So, so far, I've not disagreed with anything. Again, Emer from Educate Together. Again, we need more schools run by organizations as no churches. I would argue that no schools should be run by churches. But again, I agree generally with her point. 
Uh, prepare for an AI-driven world. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, Catherine Byrne, who is also not a teacher, she's more of a campaigner. So as much as no teacher was looked at for this article and no teacher uh, was asked to give input into it, there's nothing in that. Uh, there's really nothing in there that you disagree with too much. You do just wish they might have asked teachers about it. And the trouble is, all of these issues are absolutely necessary. But it's interesting. I asked on Twitter or on X, teachers, because teachers are giving out, OK, tell me then, OK, what do teachers want? And it's interesting, the responses that most teachers gave. And there were some really good responses. But the ones that kind of jumped out at me were, weren't very sexy. <laughs> and that's not a criticism. But it's like smaller class sizes, more support for children with additional needs. The, these kind of things, the things that Carl O'Brien would probably go, oh, God, I can't really get an article out of that. That's not very sexy. Uh, I need some AI in here. I need some Adam Harris. There's a lot of criticism, though, that came from this article and I thought, that, you know, that I didn't mention was it was the first sentence here, the par- of here, which I actually agree with. Ireland has, in many respects, a 19th century school system with 20th century technology, which, for all its achievement, needs to be overhauled to meet the needs of 21st century. I think he's right. Uh, a lot of people are very dis- disgruntled by that, uh, particularly teachers who are very innovative and are meeting some of those needs. But they're not, I think what Carla Bryan, whether he means it or doesn't, but I, I interpret from what he's saying, is that the system, the system is not a 21st century system. There's lots of teachers trying to shoehorn 21st century methodologies into their jobs. But the trouble is uh, we are working in these little box rooms. We don't use our space very well. We don't have the space. Schools aren't built very well. The rooms aren't very good. There's not not as restrictive movements. I I honestly think, uh, and this is going back to Estonia, it's how we use space. If we could use space better, if we had the structures, we had the systems to be able to use that space better, if we didn't have all these unnecessary, knotty complications within our system to restrict us, we would have a really good system, a good 21st century system. However, as I say, I can understand how it's irked uh, teachers who do try to shoehorn 21st century methodologies into these uh, systems. And, it, and, and they are doing very well despite the structure. But it is the structures, I think, that need to change. And I guess that's what I would do if I were the Minister for Education. Just a reminder before we finish up, don't forget, if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe uh, to the onshot.net newsletter, which you can find on onshot.net slash subscribe. And you will find every two weeks right to your inbox. You'll be reminded of our latest podcast episode. Some other news stories uh, that I'm meeting have been capturing my imagination. And uh, some of those are up there. I don't I don't really discuss them on the podcast because I just don't have space to be here all day. But I'll be talking about uh, a lot of those uh, in bite sizes. I also scour my Twitter or my X to find some really good tweets and uh, little threads that have come out that will be very interesting. And as I said, I have a little bit of CPD for anyone who wants it. This is a 16 minute video on how to use AI to create a unit of work to make a chapter of a school textbook. And if you subscribe, I'll be sending you out a template with loads of prompts to create that chapter of a textbook. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode of If I Were the Minister for Education. I'll be back in a couple of weeks time with some more news, uh, no doubt, about the INTO Congress, which will have been and gone and whatever else comes from that. Anyway, thanks so much for listening or watching. And if, uh, as I said, please feel free to subscribe or review this podcast on your favourite platform. And until next time, see you then. All the best. Bye bye.